for attending this press conference at the office of the president. I thought today I should just bring you up to date on a few issues that have been in the public domain, but we have not been able to address in the past month or so, largely because of the political season when we had local government elections. A lot of people were focused on the campaign and those elections. And so we want to return to a lot of the development agenda and just to bring you briefly up to date because over the course of the next several weeks you will meet and discuss a lot of these issues with the relevant ministers. So on the Marriott, um, we've, we've been asked questions about that often. And we said that the evaluation had to be completed. N Nissel has completed that evaluation. They have ranked the firm that had a bid of 90 million as number one rank, the highest bid and they've been given the authority to engage in negotiations with that company. Secondly, um, you would recall that we've been talking about a bridge across the river at Wisma in Linden. We have, this is a promise that we made not in our manifesto, but subsequently when we visited the area. And um, we're at the stage where we're ready to start the negotiations. We've had three offers. And when the details emerge, you will see that um, the offer that we have received is very, very competitive. It's to do a four-lane bridge across the river for a cost of about 35 million US dollars. When there was a previous study that showed a, a two-lane bridge there across the river with a higher sum, higher than the 35 million, the estimates were higher. So this is a very competitive bid. Um, we've had. Um, and this is with the same company that is building the bridge across the the Demara River here in Georgetown. Um, the same team that negotiated the that arrangement, we are we've asked the Minister of Finance to pull together back the team, and that team was made up of. Mr. Gaskin, Tenny Husti, um, the Financial Secretary, and Birch, Ronald Birch Smith. These are the four individuals who negotiated that project, um, the one across the Demar, both are across the Demara River, but the one in Georgetown. They would also be engaged in that, the company to finalize the contract. Uh, and so we anticipate that before the end of this year, construction of the four-lane bridge, concrete structure um, across the river at Wisma will start. Um, uh, uh, on the campaign trail, um, and even before that, a number of people have had serious misgivings about the part-time program, largely because they were fed with a diet of lies, uh, that it's a temporary program and that people would be fired as soon as the elections are over. Well, that's not true. And I want to assure the people, many of them in every part of the country, from regions one to 10, the way that we have visited, that we intend to expand the program, not reduce the numbers of people, because especially in the rural and hinterland areas and 
in places like Region 10, where people still need these programs until they can find regular jobs, that this program will be expanded to, to accommodate a number of people. And the focus here, again, is to ensure that more women get em employment with the aim of bringing more female into the workforce in the long run. We are hoping that a lot of the people who are working on these part-time programs, that they will also be studying and they will apply for the scholarship. So that brings me to the scholarships. A lot of the applications are out, so I want to say to the people who requested this, again on the campaign trail, they ask you a lot of things about when would it, how can they access the scholarships, etc. A lot of those things are now advertised. If they need further information, they can contact us and we'll give them the opportunity to do so. Also the training programs. I've, I, I've asked several community groups to pull together people who want to be trained in particular, particularly in the tech voc area and carpentry, welding, uh, being um, electricians, plumbers, etc. And I hope that they will all get in touch with me soon, having put together groups so I can ask the Minister Hamilton to meet with them and then we can engage, actually start the training of those individuals. And this is right across the country. Again, from every region we've gone into, these community groups have approached us. So it's up to them to, to start doing some of the work, right? gathering up people. Often when we just put out an ad, people, a few people may apply, but we need a critical mass like maybe 10, 15 persons to start a training program in one of these areas. So I'm hoping that they will um, look at this. Another thing that we discovered, and yesterday I had a meeting with a small business bureau, is that over the past two years, they have they've been going around the country requesting applications for grants. People have had to go through a long process of establishing companies and getting compliance, and many of them have never heard back from the agency. So there are nearly 800, seven to 800 persons there. And yesterday we went through the list. They have a sum of money, and every one of those persons will get some help. So if they were on the list, they will now get the assistance. And this is not the business grant, the small business grant that is given out directly by the government through the Ministry of Local Government. This is through the, the um, Tourism Ministry. So that I just want people to understand that there's a difference between the two. Now you've had a lot of um, issues with small business grant being given out and it was a bribe for people in to vote PPP. In fact, we've just done about 5% of the what is, is there to be given out. Just about 5% has been actually given out. We still have about 95% of the, the funding there to address small business grants in the country. So APNU would have you believe that we shared out all of this money here. Even in the city, in many of the constituencies, etc. Like in the city, they have not received small business grant. In Linden, in New Amsterdam, they have not received and they will receive as, as people in Region 2 and Region 6 and other regions, all the other regions will have to receive their grant to Region 10, 9, etc small business grant, but that's true, a separate process. That's not the grant that I spoke of earlier where people have had to go through this very detailed process of doing financials and getting their cash flow right and establishing companies. It was a humbug to business development. So we are changing that model, but we want the people who had applied for a very long time, for years, to understand they're going to get some help. That is true, the Ministry of, of to Tourism there. The President has been engaged in a major 
push internationally um, or not political diplomacy but economic diplomacy and so what he has done is open up a lot of doors to the financial institutions that we some we have had traditional relations with and there are other new ones coming um, appearing now and we are developing relations with them so take for example the Saudi Fund for Development we got a loan for $150 million from them at 2% at interest. Now, if you go to the markets now, a US dollar based loan base uh, because of the interest rate escalation could be 5, 6% now. And so it helps to still access funding through bilateral sources from these development agencies. And there are very few strings attached to these loans. I don't mean the political strings, but some of them have, like if you take a loan from Exim in the US, it's mainly for a US company. So, <clears throat> so this, this loan would allow us to accelerate our housing program. You recall that we said that we wanted to do 50,000 house lots in the five year term. We're about 30,000 now. In Region 3 alone, 14,000 people are waiting. You've heard what we said on the campaign trail, that APNU gave away all the lands at Wales. We're trying to take back some of those lands to develop the housing. So 100 million will go immediately for that. We'll try, we're, some of the international funding that we're also getting, because so far we have carried the, the road, the four-lane road on the East Bank to Diamond be on the local budget. That is our own budget, fully funded by our local budget and Guyana dollars. And we've just extended that around Diamond to Busby Dam now. We are extending that to bypass the choke point at Grove. Even though we are widening that a little bit, there's a choke point at Grove. So we are now looking at some additional funding internationally to take this all the way to Suicide. Yesterday I had a meeting with with the Ministry of Public Works and all the officials and the road to the east uh, from Providence to the airport. Um, we are at the stage where we are going to get contractors soon to widen the road by four feet on both sides and repave the whole road. That is on the main road all the way to the airport. And then the linden Dyke Highway, we're at a stage where we just have the consultants now. We've selected the consultants. They have they've pre-qualified the contractors. Consultants have to, to do a review on the design. So we anticipate starting the linden Dyke Highway, paving that before the end of the year two to start that work. Um, on the East Coast, the Chinese have been given clearance on the design um, on the four-lane road, and so we expect work to start there. In Burbies, the four-lane road, we are advancing that too. So we've had a total review. On community roads, um, yesterday we decided that about a billion dollars of community roads will be done in Essequibo, 1.6 billion in Linden, um, um, in every, every region almost, every region of community roads. These were roads that were going to be done now. The model is, especially where it's concrete roads, we've asked the Ministry of Public Works to ensure that people from these regions, they get their work. So that, because when they're concrete roads with good supervision, they can hire the local contractors. And, but with proper supervision to see that quality is maintained. So what I just mentioned two regions, but it's for all the regions. Region 3, um, East Coast, I want to say to the people in the East Coast, when I go there, they ask, a lot of roads on the East Coast will, will be done, East Bank, Region 5, every, every region. We, we promise in, um, in the hinterland regions, a billion dollars is being set aside for Region 9. But in, in Region 1, we are going to complete the part from by Santa Rosa going up to the school. And then we've decided to do a two kilometers of roads there in the region, concrete roads. It's about, in that sub-district, 
two kilometers. It's about a million dollars, US, US dollars per kilometer in concrete roads. So that's about two million US. But we're starting from Quibana coming back this way and then from the Moruka end going up. So hopefully over time they'll meet in, somewhere in between. In Mabaruma, the settlements, we promised the people that they will get the road in the settlements. We're doing three kilometers in the settlement and on the road, the continuation of the road going into Wauna. Um, in Port Kaituma, we're doing two kilometers. We want to do internal roads in Kaituma done first and then four miles and Orinoc and all of those areas. And then in the future, linking them. So, so we, we mapped out, we've gone back into the important things that we found on the campaign trail. A lot of people raise these issues. Roads are a big concern. That's a primary concern of most of the communities. The roads to schools are a priority. Schools and hospitals, we give public work. Those must be fixed now, um, almost immediately. So we're we're just refocusing the entire government after the hiatus of, of the campaign to on the things that matter to people, job creation, health care. We're, we're now moving forward with the design for the four facilities in the hinterland. Um, that is the hospitals, the New Amsterdam, all of, all of those, the 12 hospitals we're talking about whilst we're looking at upgrading the others. Um, these are these are important. Just some of the things that over the past maybe two days, two three days, now that we got in our candidates, we the party we submitted our 900 odd um, councillors for seats because we won over 900 seats. We've submitted those names to GCOM, um, so we expect GCOM to gazette those. We took a couple of days to go through that because we have done it in a very democratic way. We've gone back to get in every, every local government area in the country, in all 80 of them, we brought the people together who contested and had their views um, solicited when we decided on who will represent us, especially from the PR portion of, of, the, um, of the list, because um, the constituency portions are being settled. I gather today we are pulling lots in, in Burbies. I don't know how that went before the magistrate for two constituencies. But one, if, if we win in one, it could flip another area in our favor. That is cut brat. So if we win one of the, the constituency, because they now have to pull a lot in front of a magist magistrate. Um, so since then, we have returned to government and in full earnest, all of the, I want to assure people that a promise is made on the campaign trail, notwithstanding the fact we, we didn't win Georgetown or New Amsterdam or Linden. As I've said before, the results from a party perspective have been phenomenal in these areas. We're encouraged by these results. We're happy about them in many parts of the country, in almost every area that APNO is contested. And I need to reiterate this in light of some of the editorials we keep seeing from Starbuck News and the others. It's been a resounding success everywhere, not only in the 66 areas we won, but in the 14 areas. In Mocha, we won more votes, significantly more, from seven, 17 votes up to over 200 votes. In Kwakwani, we won more votes, nearly more than double our votes there in Kwakwani. In Georgetown, we increased our votes by over 75 percent. When APNU's vote from 2018 AFC vote declined. In Linden, our votes increased by 500 percent. And so it 500 percent may seem, oh well, just go to the percentage. It's over 2,000 people voted more in Linden, all maybe afro guyanese who voted for this party in one community. And in New Amsterdam, our votes increased by over 100%. And we narrowly, narrowly almost clinched the council. There's a two seat difference now, down from a, a eight seat difference in the past. 
a two seat difference. In Madia, we won the popular vote. In Martika, we won the popular vote. So, so I don't know what they're celebrating about. And but but we made, we said to people, we'll we'll work with you to improve your communities, and that means we have to to keep working harder now, not easier before. We have another two and a half years or so before elections because elections would be held somewhere in November 2025. Don't listen to this fabrication by Christopher Jones. He knew we were holding elections on the 18th of December this year. It, it's utter nonsense, as you've seen. Um, they, it's, it, to think that in this day and age people will create such a such a huge lie work is unbelievable. Anyhow, that's we have another couple of years, two and a half years, to, to ensure that more of these concerns that we heard on the campaign trail are raised. So on the food security side, um, apart from the economic diplomacy the president has been doing, he's been doing a great job on the food security agenda globally, pushing that agenda. He has the ECA has even recently given him an award for the aggressive nature of the work he's doing globally, pushing food security as a major area. And so, so you've heard about the different plants that we are looking at, energy security, food security, climate security, three major planks of our foreign, foreign policy and he's been championing all of them globally. And, and so, domestic, but there is, there is a, a domestic, a local component to that agenda. And the local component is to enhance production and productivity in our agricultural sector, and also to expand, to expand the range of products that we are now producing and exporting. I don't want to go through that again, but we have resumed all the discussions we've had with India on developing all the spices and the greater productivity in the rice sector and, and cane by maybe even doubling the, the output in these sectors with just a change in the variety of the plants that we use the tissue culture lab to do four million plants, bringing in the Brazilian dwarf, 35,000 nuts, all of those, we have refocused on that. You're gonna see a big focus back on the agricultural sector. And people in, in Port Kaichuma, I said to them, why don't we do more plantains here? And one lady said to me, we have a problem, the sucker, the planting material, it's too costly. It's nearly $800 for one of those. So I've had discussion with the regional chairman over the course of this week, and we are looking, and also some of our activists in Port Kaituma in these areas, we're looking to establish a major nursery there. And so the Ministry of Agriculture will go there and look in to see if we can't upgrade certification so our products can sail directly into the Caribbean from these areas without having to come to the coast because the coast can't be a market for their planting. It's, they would face serious competition from growers who are producing on the coast already. So this sort of thing is being worked on in all of the areas we've gone. They need help um, at, at covid and um, livestock rearing, better quality animals and all of that. So we've, we've gone back to a lot of those things that may have may have taken a, um, a little hit in the past because in terms of time because of the campaign. Now um, on the on the auction we we plan to we'd have to extend it as I said before for another period. We'll determine what period should not be for much much of a time but 
almost every one of the people who have indicated an interest so far in participating in the auction, they've been told, and I think they appreciate it that we are sticking with our commitment to have the framework law in place and the new PSE before the bids come in. And so we are, we, as I promised the last time we spoke, we have now put out the Petroleum's Activities Bill for the public consultation. Um, the, I've seen various comments about it from, again, predictably, that the time is too short. I can read the bill overnight, maybe in an hour even, and understand it. I can read it overnight and have all my views there. Oh, the two that the bill is shorter than the last one. That's another comment we've heard. Well, the idea globally, we have examined, we had a global firm that worked on this with enormous experience in the sector. We look at similar framework legislation globally and a lot of the, the issues addressed in those modern pieces of legislation where we were deficient in our laws have been addressed. And a lot, a lot of the issues would be dealt subsequently after the passage of the bill through regulations. So we anticipate the passage of the, the Petroleum Activities Bill. It becomes an act and then thereafter a series of regulations to give effect to the bill. It's, the regulations are now required for the auction. We can work at that. Now, we are repealing all of the regulations under the old act, but we have looked at if anything would suffer in the absence of the repealed regulations. Like if we repeal them and there are no new regulations right at this time. And we've, we've looked at them, and most of those regulations deal with reporting issues. And a lot of these are already covered in the existing PSAs, so there'll be no, no major gap at, um, between the period when we, we pass the law and repeal the regulations to the enactment of the, the new regulations. No major policy gap or enforcement gap. And that is why we have looked at it. I hope that you examine it carefully. Um, Kaichur News is known for distorting, but there are some good, two good reports, and I suspect that's when the professionals wrote, wrote them and not the, the, the craziness that goes on there. I don't want to call a madman, mad but uh, one on June 22nd. Um, here and another one about on June 21st. Government proposes arming natural resources minister with sweeping power over the oil sector and draft oil law proposes to give minister power to waive payment of 10% royalty. These are two professionally written articles and they would um, and they basically outline the content of the bill and where it expands so if you you read those, you will see that you can, you can see where they're, the key elements of the bill for those who don't want to study it or get into great detail. But there are a couple of new areas. It's about storage. So definitely we, the old bill never dealt with that, the 1986 one. And then, um, so that is now part of the new act. So if you, you look at carbon capture and storage, then transportation is another area that we inserted in the bill. Um, now, having said that, the, the, the headline, um, another headline that must have come from Glenn Lal, I have it here, which is that we um, basically, Ghanese leaders relied on outdated law for years, but only addressing them for auction of the 14 new blocks. That's a Glenn Lal headline. That's not a professional headline. So we have started looking at differentiating the mad, and I heard now he has Adam Harris back there now. Adam Harris has returned. 
you know, you know the man who fell out who was distorting the stories about about um, the elections who was distorting changing the stories who's been there so I expect a lot of lawsuits in in the future and this time the lawsuits don't take 10 years to come up they come up fast now so you've seen seen it's already shifting away from oil and gas into scandals again you've seen the front page already examine the front page the last week and you see adam harris trademark now adam harris is the man who addresses norton as the great leader the great leader the kim will sung syndrome so so um so we're happy about that we have managed to keep our commitment i want to urge people to read the act read it in comparison with the 1986 law share your comments don't be lazy like the opposition don't be not just lazy not to share comments but lazy even to read anything i was explaining yesterday that ramjatan who is a lawyer by training and a leader of a party posted in a forum the law and complain about the short time and then when challenged robustly about it he said why are they talking about royalty and stuff two percent they could have just put what the number is here in the bill this is the petroleum activities bill they could have just put a five percent or a ten percent or something i can share with you the screen captures that we have then you will understand how hollow these people are, people like Ramjatan and the opposition. They wouldn't even take the time to read the bill. This guy, they made a mess. The FC had control over this sector through Trotman. Ramjatan was the one defending the 2% royalty. We have now moved that to 10%. He was defending the 2% royalty, and he didn't have the even decency to know the difference between the PSA and the Petroleum Activities Bill. He doesn't even know the difference. Uh, I, I think I'll share with you at some point in time then so you can get into how, how shallow their efforts are on the part of these people. The people. They, can, they can deal a lot with scandals. On technical issues, zero. Um, I, maybe I will end here. Um, you've seen the, the issue of the opposition now on the Nigel Darmlal matter. That, the file, from what I gather, has been sent to the DPP. Um, I think the least we say about it because the more we speak from the executive, it's distorted by an industry out there to say that we are attempting to exonerate or cover up any issue. And that is why, from the beginning, the president made it clear, and I endorse what he said. He said, in our midst, and this goes for both party and government, we don't tolerate abuse of children and women. And two, if the allegations prove true, if the minister is found guilty, then he must face the consequences. Our position remains the same. We've allowed the process outlined by our law, the 2010 Act that we passed, now President, the Sexual Offenses Act, we have allowed that process to to be followed strictly to the letter of the law. We have not attempted to politicize the matter or to, to intervene to subvert the court of justice. You can't try the minister by social media, nor can you disparage the victim by social media. And that was our position. By APNU making this a political issue, they may have even influenced people's opinions on these matters. 
where people were dealing with the issue purely on its merit. But when you have the entire opposition in a duplicitous fashion, couldn't agree on anything, descend on this matter where the minister is off already. He's off. Now they think they want him to be fired, even before the matter is fully investigated or the investigation had been completed. They want him fired. They protest for that. It is for to draw attention to this issue. And also, I believe, to divert attention from their electoral loss, massive loss, and the internal infighting. I saw that has happened today, a story about them fighting with each other over the selection process of who will represent them. And they have just over 200 persons, 200 seats that they won. We won over 900 seats. We have gone forward with our, our people. Um, that is our councillors. So then they, they have done this. They've, they have resurrected all the old propaganda sites. If you look at them that were defunct for three, four years, the old APNU sites that were established in the past, pre-2020, to stir trouble and to spread racism. Their primary task at that time was to carry racist messages. They've resurrected them. They've become active again. They've rolled out the lunatic fringe, the criminal Burke and the bench cop and the Sherrod Duncans and all of them. They rolled them out in full force to make this uh, a big political issue. And they don't care, nobody cares whether what they post is factual or not. If you know Rickford Burke, he is a criminal. He's been posting, he's been extorting people. They're not known for, for, make, for, for being factual. So they will post all sorts of things because they believe that they can somehow taint the PPP by making this one an issue here which must be fully investigated and the course of justice um, be, be followed, they're making it an issue of PPP. If, I, if we wanted to do tit for tat, you have them sordid stories in APNU. We have brought to the attention of the public in the past, but we, we left it for them to address because a lot of this is about consenting. Look at Red Thread. Red Thread has become active again. This is a vile group made up. They're only active when, if they perceive there is a weakness in the, the PVP. You've had some of the most vile molesters. I saw them dragging in people from Region 9, some of our activists today by a new post. We had Carl Parker there. You remember Carl Parker? the PNC lead man in the region. People don't remember that. I didn't see Red Thread for one single day appear. They didn't even help the, the victim. And the, and the person who was the victim, I think, was a member of the PNC. But this is how it goes. They're, they're, they sense a little opening, and they have to divert attention from their, from their failure at their local government elections. They, I heard they have all sorts of negotiations going on internally now. Trying, and Norton is using this as a distraction. I heard internally that they're trying to even offer him money to leave the post. They, they hear a lot of inside stories from the PVP, like Christopher Jones heard from inside story we were hosting. We were having elections on the 18th of December. Well, I've been hearing a lot of inside stories too from their camp. And my inside stories have a bit more basis in fact. Because a lot of the people that are there have been calling the government for favor, favors who sometimes sit in the meetings there. So, so, um, so this matter, we, it's best that the government, as is the executive, because Nigel Darmlau is a member of the executive, 
say the least in the public domain. Because the more you speak about the matter, it would be seen as attempting to influence the outcome or cover up the matter. And we are not doing anything of the sort. The agencies that should deal with these matters are the police, child care, the DPP, the courts. These are, that, that's it. And you, I see you have some NGOs. But if you trace, if you look at this matter carefully, the involvement of political operatives on the other side from the beginning, from the beginning, they were, were involved in this matter. And so that's what I'm going to say as it relates to that matter. We, we saw some reports now um, from how Exxon captured a country without firing a shot. And so Glenn Lyle complained how he lost his reporters, people stole his reporters, and Exxon stole them. Basically, that they're bribed off. And Melinda Janke, um, it's not that, not that they're reporters, they were running from, from his madness, I think. And I think this was in the public domain and his abuse. That's what they were running from. And also Melinda Janke, I see in one section, she was the one who Chetty Jagan ratified her version of the EPA law. And in the constitutional, the right to a healthy environment for current and future generations was ratified by part of the constitution in 2003 because she championed it. It seems as though Cherry Jagan was not the president or I wasn't the president. Melinda Janke did that. You know, all of this, everything she did, she brought the laws. I know about this, Melinda Janke did everything. She passed the constitution of Guyana, she passed the environmental laws, she's been the conscience. I've seen some of these fringe elements, they don't know the discussions we've had at cabinet, the extensive discussion. That sexual oriented law, um, the, the Sexual Violence Act, we've had lots of issues, including issues of chemical castration for peop people who have committed rape and all of that. And then the human rights came, we had it in the first version of the law. And people said, no, you can't do that, it's brutal, it's thing and stuff. That people, you would, not everyone is a recidivist and you can rehabilitate people. We said the experience shows that that's not so. We had extensive discussions week after week at the cabinet before that Sexual um, Offenses Act of 2010 was passed and all of its provisions to protect people. We even made it illegal for you because we had at that time, I had a case where a young lady came and said that there are some guys who took images of her and were extorting her. And we also included in the act the, uh, that if you share these images of people without their consent, you could get into serious jail because we were trying to protect people from being blackmailed, young people. And that was the discussion we had in 2009, long before we passed the law in 2010, when I was president, even then, in those days. And, and so, a lot of these things have a huge discussion. The EPA Act, it was a Melinda Janke draft. A number of people were hired around the world to, to look into this and discussions. I was a part of the cabinet then. We had discussions on that. On the constitutional reform, you had a, a full group of people, five from the government, five from the opposition, that led the process throughout the country. She takes credit for that. So this is, it's, it's, a, it's sick to see that. But the, people can rewrite history now because sometimes we never focus on documenting these things. You just work and you keep working all the time to improve things. And then some elements like these can then come along and take credit because nobody knows 
about the past, take credit for everything positive and all the negatives, they heap at the PPP doorstep, but they take credit for anything good that's happening in the, in the country. Like Norton did in Linden, he's taking credit for, for all the things, the positive things, and, and, the, uh, and, and then the negatives. So I'm not gonna waste my time because these, this here quoted three, three people that I don't have any regard for their integrity, frankly speaking. Tom Sanzillo, Glenn Lal, and, and Melinda Janke. And that's what the article is about. So if you've ever, most people have not read it, but don't read it. It's not, oh no, you don't waste your time, please. That's all I'm going to say today. Thank you. Um, no, because he's not attended any of the party uh, meetings that we've had since. Um, but the president spoke about this, that the minister within the ministry would assume responsibility for the portfolio, Ms. Stan and Passat. Going back to 2016 to the present, there has been a series of misconduct allegations involving Minister Darla. Yet, your party would have selected him to be a member of parliament and a minister of government. How does the duty respond to that? Yeah, but I don't want to. I can answer this issue when we're done with this matter. That's before the court. I'm not going to answer that issue now because it could again be seen. If I'm going to defend him now, then it would be seen as relating to this matter. And I don't want to say anything on any issue with Nigel Daramlal at this point in time that may be seen as, as the opposition is making and the social media people as attempting to subvert the course of justice. So any issue I'm prepared to answer after this matter has been, has been dealt with at the DPP level, et cetera. Because if, if you, will, you will see what I say here now appearing as though I'm speaking about this matter. And that's why I'm very, very cautious about that. So I will stay away from answering all of those questions until anything to do with Dharma, until this matter has been decided. Um, today we saw Rogers put another statement, a uh, story after, saying that Exxon is in negotiation with the government of Iran for an extension of the 2027. Um, um, on what? On the expiration. Oh, no. We, we have said before that the expiration date, right? We had given approval for one year force majeure. That was when in the COVID period. So the relinquishment provision will shift by one year. That is all that is. It's not a negotiation. It is not a negotiation. Now, that is all, the extension. And then I explain further that on the, the project to supply the, the gas to the pipeline, that will receive a 10 years extension because it expires, I think, in 2037. And if the project comes on stream in 2025, then you would only have 12 years of life of the project. You need at least 20 years of supply of gas to the project. So those are the only two issues that are there and we are, we're not in negotiations. We have agreed to do the extension of the LISA 1 for that purpose, to supply more gas for a longer period, and because we wanted that. And then the force majeure that was given to them in the COVID period extends the relinquishment provision. There is no negotiation. Now we have to sit and discuss with them 
the relinquishment of the 20 percent so maybe they confuse the the relinquishment of the 20 percent those are the two extensions or that we talk about we can talk about no 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 because we're clear about that they have to relinquish 20 percent of the the block by a par particular date that date by this extension would have shifted next year by the force majeure in the COVID period. And the other extension is the one I explained to you. So we are not really negotiating that. We're discussing that. So if I could follow up on that, the granting of the one year force majeure extends the period of relinquishment of 20% to this year to next year. To next year. And, and it also extends the relinquishment of the entire block one year to Yeah, so, so once that kicks in, then everything follows subsequently. You, you, you understand? Right. Okay, I'm Kim Wong King. Um, I'd like to ask about the development activities. Do you have any comments on this article here? Do you have a comment on the guy and how excellent stole you from Glen Lab? I'm only here to ask questions. <laughs> All right, okay. All right. Yeah, so there is a framework for carbon storage licensing in this bill. Can you talk about what's the government's vision for that? Like when you intend to tap into this to start this doing carbon storage licenses? And on the bill, I wanted to ask too about the provisions with respect to royalty that talk about uh, the question of deferring or remitting payment of royalties, under what scenarios would the government have to consider doing something like that? Um, so, so that's it on the bill. And I also wanted to ask about the delay of the auction, because you have talked about uh, the need to be competitive. And I wonder if this delay can interfere sure. with our ability to be competitive sure. against all the other countries that they are is competing with against. And if you think it could send the message that altogether, because in this country, if it's not local government, it's, it's, it's always something happening. Whether um, other things can distract the government and get into to the way of timely approval and regulation, especially when you issue blocks and yeah, the sure. sector expands. A lot of the, the delay here is in the amount of work necessary. So here we had anticipated earlier drafts um, and then we got the drafts. So only the draft law we had last week, we reviewed it and then we put it out internally and then we put it out for public auction. So even if we wanted to go before but we wanted our consultants to make sure that they study the international experience. We didn't want to be like we did with the PSA. Even when we were dec deciding on the changes to the fiscal terms, it took a long time. We did it through an iterative process because we wanted to see that we get significantly more from the, for Guyana from the production of oil and gas which I think we have succeeded by changing these fiscal terms now in the future, but also remaining globally competitive. So that required us to understand the global situation with all of the regimes they, in, in over 100 countries, their regimes, and then also then crafting our fiscal terms to make sure that we got more, but we remain competitive. These things take time. We probably, we thought, we're a bit more optimistic that we could have gotten them done. But I think what is, we have enormous credibility. So first thing is that we're one of the hottest spots in the world. So the others who are in the auction process, and over 80 of them, I don't think they have the record of, of discoveries like that. So that's one, people are interested. Two, the 
they, I think they appreciate in our discussion. So we got back to them. So we're not going to lose any interest. Those who express interest. Those who express interest. We got back to them, so they're not going to lose interest. And three, I think they appreciate that we're sticking with our commitment, that we will ensure that they have a predictable framework into which they're bidding. Many countries don't do that. They have an opaque framework, and then they keep changing things all the time, and it doesn't lend to investors' confidence. So I think they appreciate that we're sticking with our commitment, which is a new PSC and a new law before, so they can study both before they put in their final offer. So I think this will not cause them to, to move from Ghana. We have moved faster on establishing a framework in Ghana. So if you talk about SLOT, we move faster in establishing a framework than most countries have. They look at the local content law. Lots of countries that are producing oil and gas for decades didn't pass a local content law, as robust as ours. So I think they understand that we're taking this seriously. The, the, no, it's IHS market. Okay. IHS market. And, and so that's one. I just have two more to go. Um, the royalty situation. So the first draft has the minister. We are looking at seeing if we can strengthen that, that only the cabinet could. So the minister has to have the approval of the entire cabinet. It should there arise a situation where they can defer the royalty or, or um, like reduce, reduce the royalty. Now, you, you, the Archive News article outlines the penalties once they, they don't pay. They have to pay within a particular period. There is a jail term attached to the payment of royalty. But what, say, if the price of, let me give you, I don't want to speculate because I'm worried about speculating and Kaichur News distorts everything. But let me give you, let me, let me give it a shot. So for example, Lisa won. We need now the gas to, to run our power plant, supply of power. But the oil prices fall to $20 a barrel. And the cost of production is $25 a barrel. Right? So they, they can sell, from selling oil a barrel, you get $20, but it costs you $25. Loss making situation. And then on that, on top of the, the $20, you have to pay the royalties too, the 2% royalty. So our aim is to keep the well going so that we can get the gas for power supply. So in a situation like that, you, that is how it could be exercised. You asked for an example. And that's, I, I, I just gave you an example of that sort of situation. But we believe that not just any minister can do that. But the minister has to consult with the minister of finance. But I believe this must go to the cabinet. Any such thing should go to the cabinet. So people can put in those comments. We ourselves are looking at that strengthening to see how it must be done with the consent of the full cabinet of the country. So you don't have a maverick situation like what Trotman did, run off and sign an agreement on his own. There was another one. Oh, carbon capture, carbon storage. So the law, you're right, now broadens its scope to, um, to deal with carbon storage. Now globally, the solution to net zero, um, people are saying it will come from a combination of things. We believe that. You have some extremist views, but our view that, that you would achieve net zero through a combination of measures. One is to reduce fossil fuel, fuel production globally from 100 million barrels today, per day to maybe 25 million barrels by 2050. That is consistent with the IEA estimate because they would still need oil for a number of things, including the cosmetic industry and a whole range of stuff. So that's one of the measures. Two from the introduction of renewables. 
and um, which which would be important because it displaces the again fossil fuel production and three from new technologies so technologies now are being developed that you can directly extract not at scale yet co2 from the atmosphere you can directly extract it carbon capture and storage has been studied as one of the ways where you, when the, the methane or the CO2 comes out, you capture, you, you re-inject it and seal it so it doesn't come into the atmosphere through new technology. And then, of course, saving the water forest, reducing mitigation from that. So, you can have a number of other things like reducing vehicle emission standards, etc. Combination of all these measures would allow us to cap, address net zero. So in Guyana's case, we're looking at our carbon footprint by tripling output, but reducing from energy our emissions by 70% by 2030. That's what we're hoping to achieve. Two, we're hoping that the new FPSOs would be, and they are already, one, the new one coming would be 25% less carbon inten intensive than the earlier ones. So new technology in the extraction process and processing of the oil. And then three, Exxon has already asked to study carbon capture and storage. So our laws now would have, can allow people or direct them, the minister can direct them to do some of these things in the future. The old law would not allow that. Like the new law now, even beyond our share, if we, if we have 10, I say a million barrels a month from Exxon. That's our share of oil. And we need two million for domestic demand. We can direct the company now to supply the rest. We can put in strategic reserves. So the law is looking at all of these things in a modern kind of environment. All right. Yes. Yeah, no, no, let me come here. Oh, you got, I didn't get Kai chores yet. So. All right, let me go to the young lady, then I come across here. So the non-traditional, a lot in the Middle East. So the Islamic Development Bank, they started up, new started a relationship with them, didn't go very far. We have now a big relationship. You remember North Jordan came and said, you got 900 million loan, Google it, and there was no loan, zero. Right, Google that now if you have the time, and you'll see we responded to it in opposition. So we got a 200 million loan from them for the Linden Suicide Highway, they're funding other things. So strengthening there. Um, in Qatar, the president was there, met with the Emir and the others. They were looking at about a $350 million line of credit from, from their agency. The team came already to Ghana, and that was just a short visit ago. I told you about the Saudi um, fund, the fund for, for, for development. That is there too. So we got 150 million from Saudi Arabia. When I was there in in um, UAE, I also met with their. They have two funding agencies, and so though they came also with a minister who was here recently, Minister Reed from from the UAE, and so we are working closer with them too, and they have integrated an interest in funding projects here. They haven't started as it. So those are several non-traditional of the bilateral sources. From Europe, UKIF. So two big loans are um, the one for the New Amsterdam Hospital and the, the loan for the Children and Maternal Hospital. About 300 million euros will come from UKIF funding sources. So that's a new big funding source so it's out, of, out of Europe. We're exploring a lot, a lot of private um, banks. The big banks are discussing with us. 
So I just gave you a couple of examples of those. So that's what I meant by, by new agencies of a bilateral nature too. So they need, they do need sovereign guarantees. Uh, the commercial ones, they don't need sovereign guarantees. But we're trying to fix the interest rate on all of them. That is why I've said so far that we're in a good position for most, if you look at the Caribbean, most of their interest, their loans are variable interest loans. So any time, like how the interest rates move from near zero to now 6%, they're having a hard time in servicing those loans. We have only two variable rate loans, and they're both to multilateral agencies, not to private agencies. So that's why we're in a solid position to service debt in the future. And it takes up a very small share now of our total revenue. Yes, please. There was a letter that appeared in the daily newspapers regarding a concern about the possible breach of the <coughs> contract legislation in that Exxon Mobil has utilized a On the insurance? Yes. Yes, and we are examining that carefully. I saw it too. I didn't get wrong to fully look at it, but I'm, I, I, we are examining it carefully about brokers. Right? So we'd have to deal with that matter. I have not, I've not had the full report as yet, but I will get the report. It it's, came to my attention, so it's in the head, but I haven't gotten a chance to, to address it as yet. No problem. And on the local content issue as well, is there any interest from government to table a report that shows the progress you have made with the local content legislation? I think, I, think, I think it's time that we have that. Remember we said we have to assess. So it's time, before we go table a report there, I think it should be the public, where we invite the media, everyone, all the people, and we have a frank assessment of what worked, what didn't work, how we can enhance it, and bring the oil and gas companies too, listen to their challenges too, because at the end of the day, we want them to, drive more business to our people. And even, even the differences in estimates, because they had a lower figure than we had. So <clears throat> I'm using their figure now. I was using our figure, so I'm not dropped to $400 million. Um, but, but that came to Guyanese businesses. So I think it's time for that. I think we, we, will, we will do something like that soon. And there's a section on the bill called unitization. The unitization. So they, when we were dealing with Payara, remember the law didn't cover that. And we had about four or five through the night engagement just going through the model that we will use. So we resolved to fix that in the law now. So it's, we had this issue since prior time about how we address unitization and the legislative cover. So a lot of this, so it's not necessarily Suriname. It's there for wherever you have a situation where you right overlapping areas. So it's not only for, for Suriname. It, the law allows us to do that, what we had between, and it's not just, well, it's cross-border, but it's also between blocks too, because you could have another person owning a contiguous block. So the law addresses this now, and that was one of the things that was not in the 1986 law. So why do you say PIR? Because PIR is in the same law, but it's just that it's like multiple reservoirs. Right, so we, this, the, there were the conflicting how we address because it overlapped with some other areas. There was an overlap there. It it's deals with overlap basically. So that's the reason why. I can't tell you the details now which reservoir it overlapped with what, but that was the issue of how you treat overlaps at that time. Okay. And on the okay. Um, 
please. Ms. Um, are you concerned at all, or is government concerned that much of the interest for Exxon seems to be concentrated on the Stafford block while they still hold on to the Kaichor and Kanji um, block? Yeah, Exxon, and I um, haven't seen a lot of explorations in time. I think, I think they're encouraged by the success rate and because of the agreement too. Yeah. Because they can, they're no ring fencing. And, and we're open about it by the agreement and by the success rate. And that is why the big focus is on the Starbucks block. So there's no concern that the concentration... Remember they bought, they bought into those now, they're, they're operators in some of those blocks. And so they are operators too. Here, I think they have a huge stake too, and they, and a very lucrative PSA. It's as simple as that. We we admit it that it's a lucrative PSA. So, so there, it's a logical thing. I not that I agree with their logic, but it's logical because you will make the same decision if you are in their position. Not that I agree with that you will maximize the areas where you think you can make the most profit earlier, especially in light of net zero. And especially buoyed by the, the, the rapid pace of discoveries in, in the area on the, on the question in the Slabber block. Yes, all right, here and then I come back. Right. Actually, I'm, I'm hoping that Glenn Lal will put in a bid. He thinks this is a lucrative thing. I'm really praying that he would do that because he thinks you can make a lot of money. He has to come up with 10 million signing bonus too, right? And so I'm hoping that locals would because we deliberately, we deliberately set out to say that first, Glen Lal had a big issue with locals being involved. Oh, they don't have any capacity, they're flipping the blocks, etc. in the past. And then, suddenly he's saying the foreigners taking away everything. So he switched to the foreigners taking away everything. So we deliberately said that anyone, we, we withdrew the, the requirements of track record just to allow local people to get a fair opportunity to be part of ownership of these blocks. Because you hear a lot how they can raise the money, it's, it's lucrative, etc. So I'm hoping that they will be. But so far. No, I, I don't want to tell tales on the, I try not to keep track of those things. I don't want people to say that I'm following who's bidding and stuff. So I don't, the Ministry of Natural Resources will, tell you that, but I would advise them not to say anything at this stage until people um, put in their bids. Then everyone would know. The bids have not come in. They've just expressed interest. Some people bought the documents and stuff, the data. They have had to buy the data. And th when the bids come in, everybody, the whole country will know what the bids are. But I don't want people running down one person or another person. We will get to that at some stage. Um, I had casual conversations with some of the people in the industry, and um, some believe that overall, Exxon is going to be the Um, well, some things have changed since then, but not the fiscal terms. Um, some issues have changed because based on the feedback. Remember, we, the draft we put out, we got feedback from the oil and gas companies and the, also everyone, the public. So some things have changed. You will see the final version, not the fiscal terms. But we, do, we don't want to make it onerous and throw people in jail, but they have to comply with our laws. They have to comply with our laws. And if it says you relinquish 
you have to. But the, I think what people are smarting from some of the companies that, so if you had a, a block in the past and you had the periods, three periods, for first renewal period, second renewal, and then full re re relinquishment in the old law. So you give up 20% and then finally the block. You have to commit to a drilling program. And so even if you didn't do the drilling program, then all, the only thing you lost, is, well, you, there was no penalty to it if you didn't do the drilling program that you promised, that is mandated by the law in, in a particular period. You had to drill, then prove the resources, or declare you had, you're going to develop them. So people could hold, anybody could just take a block from the government and hold it forever and allow five years to expire and do nothing. The country loses because we have had no investment in exploring um, or anything else. So now you have to commit to do a drilling program and establish a dollar value. And if you don't pursue that, you have to pay the government almost equivalent. Well, it's only done a bit, but a huge penalty for not doing that. Massive penalties. So we don't lose opportunities by giving this to people who can't pursue a, a proper drilling program or ex utilizing the block as it should be utilized. The country doesn't lose. And that is why I think they're they don't want that in. Some people don't want that in because they want to just get the block and then whether they drill or not, then a number of years they give it up. We're saying, no, no, no. You have to co commit to a program. It's part of our law. And then you, if you don't pursue that program, your penalties, financial, massive financial penalties to not doing this, running into tens of millions of US dollars these penalties. So that's, that's the, the thing I think they're concerned about, okay. mainly. A lot of it remains. Yeah, a lot of it remains. Okay. <laughs> um, you said before that the President made efforts to try and steer petrol gas back to Canada. Yeah, um, I, we've had no further engagement on that matter, but he raised this with President Lula, and that is where it stands at this point in time. Yes, please. Yeah, go ahead. Okay. Um, for the people in the Northwest, the plans that people are going to Oh, this is in Port Kaituma. Port Kaituma. But it's not only for Port Kaituma. It would be from Machu's Ridge and Arakaka and, and Arnok and Four Miles and all of the places. This is for them. And then the Mabaruma N2. So it's, it's unique to the hinterland. So a lot of... Um, we got to focus. Those communities can't do much on oil and gas. That is why we have to push the agri-investment so that our people who live in these regions are not left behind in the remote regions of the country, that they are not left behind in the national development. We want all of our people to move forward in every region. Yeah, I think, I think that means establishing labs. The government is prepared to put the investment in, even co-investing in processing facilities with business. So if they, they produce this stuff, we can co-invest with someone to get this done. You know, like, like we're co-investing in some other areas on the call centers, like one in Barbies to work with people, like just in the Palmyra area, we're putting up that building, we're putting up another building in another part. We did it in Linden, co-investing. And then you give it to a private person or, and they run the call center and they employ people. Our, our agriculture growth has been 
a steady significant one with we'll set back only in sugar but ev almost every sector where the region fell back the region fell back and that was a regional initiative and you had about eight or nine constraining factors to agriculture one of which was scale of investment if you look around the caribbean very few people invest in agriculture on drainage and irrigation or or anything of the sort. We held, excepting for the five years on the APNU, our budget for farm to market roads, drainage and irrigation, the lifeblood of the agricultural sector, have skyrocketed. Secondly, fiscal concessions. So in many Caribbean countries, you if you're investing in tourism, you could get almost all the concessions. You build a hotel. But if you invest in agriculture, they were not getting the fiscal concessions. Unlike Guyana, how we remove all the, tra the taxes on fertilizer, pesticides, um, tractors, trailers, and everything. So it was not a, just a Guyana program. It was a regional program that we were working on, removing the constraints and getting governments to, to change their budget profile, their investment profile. Here in Guyana, we made great strides, but often like processing has been a big constraint the cost of energy hopefully that will be fixed so we can now do more value added to our agriculture and getting into the remote areas and the technical the technical assistance to those people that has lagged behind we brought in some people to look at a program called sustainable livelihoods in the amerindian areas but it didn't take off much. We started growing crab in region one, in the cages. We were doing the honey hives. We built about 900 of them there. We started in the spices, the turmeric and, and ginger. I'm talking about 10 years, 12, 13 years back. So we're not new at this sort of trying to transform the village economies and the regional economies. Um, but of course, resources often are the problem too. Now we're, we have more room in the budget, less debt payments now, more room to spend back on people. We can accelerate that. Planting material has always been the bane of the agriculture sector in Guyana. With a couple of nurseries man, managed by Nari, doing maybe 100,000 plants. I don't know how much they do. But if you go to the nurseries, you, you want to cry. They're fall, falling apart. and. A couple of trees there, uh, moringa trees, and something in the corner there. That's not how we get agriculture. That's why the tissue culture lab investing in the nurseries in a major way across the country can give good planting stock to people, bringing in new varieties, etc. Yes, please. I, I don't want to give you a deadline uh, here because I have to talk to the, to the people and also on the legislative, guilty sharer on the legislative side to see when we would have sittings of the parliament because that would all have an impact, a bearing on, on the deadline. So I need to, to do that before we settle on a, a definitive deadline. Yeah, but, but the commission is not in place, so the, the, you have to give the powers to the minister. So there is no commission at this at this stage. But it's still on your, sure. Yes, yes, but but so the minister has the powers, and the minister can delegate these powers. So under the law, the minister can delegate the powers to technical bodies. That's one. Now. If you're asking whether this law will affect the PSC and the fiscal conditions of the PSC and the Starbuck block, the answer is no. 
but the law will have impact on a number of things. For example, safety management, inspection, a whole range, carbon storage, the transport, all of that would, all, several elements of the law would have an impact also on Exxon, on Exxon Mobil, so under the PSA. Huh? So play, <clears throat> play by these rules, play by these rules, yeah. I thought I'd see Glenn Lal here today. He's been pining to come to a press conference, I think. Yeah. Oh, I, I think the board needs to deal with that. There's a chairman of the board. I can, I don't want to take over their responsibility to, the Minister of Finance is ultimately responsible, but there is a board made up of, I think the chair is Major General Joe Singh for the Petroleum Act. And this is the Petroleum Fund. We don't really run that. That is the money from the oil and gas sector that comes to the budget. Is that how government deals with oil and gas resources? This fund is insulated from the executive getting involved in their management. And so there is a board. So we can easily find out from them, you could probably call them, or the Minister of Finance, he had to go. I couldn't go to Paris because of the climate financing issue, um, but because of my work here. So he, he's now in, in France, but when he returns, you can ask him, because that is the board responsibility. Yes, please. Um, Starbuck News? Yes. Um, recently, actually, that we have seen two cases, two updates at the Minister of Finance and the Gas Plan. We are preparing one here. Um, what guarantees are, what measures are being put in place to make it as safe as possible? Yes. So, the when the plant is built, we're we still to determine who will run these facilities. We have two options. Getting, training local people and running the facilities or recruiting a firm to run the facilities for us. We pay them to manage these facilities and define the output. So we are yet to determine that. But these plants have to be of the highest international standards. You, you would recall that when we put in, we went out to the bid, we determined what type of equipment we wanted. We did, not, we did not leave it to chance, so any bidder could have put in the equipment, because we believe we want a high quality equipment in the plant. So we said you can use only plant, regardless of where you bid from. If you're a Chinese company, or a, a French company, or American company, you can only bid using G and Siemens equipment. They're known for having good quality equipment globally. So even from the conceptualization and the bidding stage, we've started looking at the quality of the equipment and safety standards. So that's an important issue for us, safety mitigation. And I'm, I'm, once a plant is being built, then when it's being built, then you can with greater level of certainty, we can say to you, here are the mitigating measures. So once the plant has been done. Is there any update to the local PSA project? Um, yes, we have an update. Um, it's, it's being processed and we anticipate, hopefully before the end of the year, it will go to the board. Um, yes, please. Yeah. Uh, what is government's strategy uh, for yes. dealing with this message? Because obviously, now more than ever, the investment climate is uh, very sensitive to certain comments. So what is your strategy for dealing with this? 
and what would you say to those who consume certain bits of information such as this and they have doubts about where Guyana's future lies for them? Yeah, now people have a right to express a view. And I may be more tolerant to views expressed by our people, Ghanese. But I don't believe some of these people who are talking about our country they have any right in this matter to lecture us about our future. First of all, I've seen the people who are speaking. They have no credibility. In their country, they wouldn't even be get hired by a medium-sized company, much less the big companies. But they make this an industry. They can't succeed in their country. They have no voice. They come around the third world and become a specialist in the third world. When you look at their qualifications or the soundness of their view, it's all hollow. And the narrative is always one thing, that people who look like us can't run our affairs. With the, once you're darker, you're not white, you can't run your affairs. And, and this is the, the kind of thing that rubs me the wrong way. Lecturing us, they don't have a clue about our country. They don't know where New Amsterdam is and the hospital that's being built here, or where Port Kaichuma is, or the road to, to or the, or the, the 14,000 house lots we are trying to develop at Wales. Nothing about the country. They don't have a clue about the expenditure. They don't read anything, but they lecture from this perspective. You know, these countries, it will never lead to prosperity. We've seen the resource curse. We've seen money stolen, etc. In their countries, you ask all of them speaking, there's no 10 years jail term for uh, the Minister of Finance for not publishing information on all receipts within three months of receipt. They will never have that in their provision. In the US, they're not part of the EITI. The US is not part of the EITI. But, but you get the lectures all the time about where we're going. We've outlined clearly the oil and gas resources. That's why we fight off the, the nonsense when Norton says a, thousand, uh, a million dollars to every Guyanese family which would result in 1.7 billion a year, and we, the last three years of oil money, we haven't even received so far 1.7 billion. We just are on that level. We fight off the nonsense, but Norton has a right, I will defend his right to say it, because he's Guyanese, and he got to, to score political points. I will defend every single day his right, even to, to lie a bit to, the, to people. Not that I agree with the lies, but he's Guyanese, born here, he, he's our blood. So they, I have a different view on, on the, from these abroad who come, the San Zillow. This guy is a, a clown. And he, he, they write and lecture us. Oh, we don't know. Let me tell you. So we said, we will save some of the money. We said it's in opposition. We're doing that through a transparent formula in Natural Resources Fund. Two, we said we're investing in education. We started with a scholarship, free university will happen. We're investing in better schools and facilities, ICT, etc., connecting our schools. Three, healthcare, we'd invest in that. Infrastructure for the future economy, highways, power plants, IC, connecting the country with ICT infrastructure, important for future industry. We're co-investing in other sectors, agriculture, etc., so that we don't become a uh, a monoculture kind of economy. Um, we, we're doing all of these things in the future. We're going to give some help to targeted groups, our children, elderly, this people living with disability. Targeted help for them. That's where we're putting, investing our money. And, and so far, it's, it's, it's going in those directions. We are clear where we want to do that and we have a transparent system but they live abroad oh we've seen it in other countries so I don't pay any attention to them that's why I didn't even want to respond to some of these things they lecture all oh, these third world people as though our brains are like somehow diminished you know or something like that 
uh, we can't plan our own way. I, I mean, tolerant of it. And I deal with it when I go abroad in the discussion fora and stuff like that, openly in the interviews and in the panels. I, I just, when I was, in the, I was on a panel with Jeffrey Sachs, and at the end he said, Ghana, the world doesn't need Ghana oil. And, and he said it at the end, but I was prepared to take him on on that issue. So, so they say these things, they lecture every, every one of us. In strengthening extradition laws or treaties. I or think <coughs> this is not on the oil and gas. You want to extradite anyone from the oil and gas sector? Mm -hmm. Okay, all right. But I think um, I think a lot of work has been done in this regard. So a lot, a lot of clarity. I don't know what you had in mind. You want to tell me a bit more about what you had in <laughs> mind specifically, and then I could um, look for a Burke. We want Burke back if to face all of his extortion charges here. He wouldn't come back. We want to strengthen the law, the extortion. But the U.S. wouldn't send him back to face his criminal charges, try to extort money from people. My understanding is that it's all system governments. There's interest from government to see where they're We constantly work at these things. We constantly work at these issues. So it's still it's a work in progress. Yeah, it's a work in progress, and we have good partners around the world, and so we hope uh, we can. Have we initiated discussions with the um, I, I don't deal with those matters. I just give Rickford Burke a cousin because he's a petty-minded person. So when I, when I come to these press conferences, I know I just call his name and point out that he's a criminal, which he is, and then for two weeks, like he gets like all catty and stuff like that, just get, getting shrilled and just posting, posting, posting everything and cussing Jaggi out of Satan and everything else. So I just do that because it gets under his skin too. But I don't know where we are there and, and what he's doing is damaging to the country. I don't really, I, these people really, he doesn't figure in my, scheme of big things. Rickford Park. Just a nuisance like Bench Cup and the Sherrod Duncan. They're nuisances to this country and, and humbug on development. They have nothing positive. I had nothing and they all have sordid, sordid history. History associated with hustling public money. So that's how I'm yeah please. Oh okay all right. I, I think the president, I know that there is a discussion on it, but we'd have to ask, ask him. I, I'm not aware when that would be launched, but it will be launched. It will be launched. The president promised that he will do that. He promised that. Them numbers there with Kaichur. So I saw you go, you come down back on the gas pipeline now, 1.7, the project, after it was put in the core document, down from 3 billion. Um, I saw now, it seems as though Kaichur News understands the, the, accounting, um, the accounting framework because they had some discussions as to why you could have a different number in. And but but I think they um let me see I got it stuff but they even distort the headline I got something here how the headline was distorted about two books the people have two books but that's required they in in law that um, they have two two books I don't have it here so I don't know what you're asking Bailey frankly speaking about this 1.842 billion and all of that those issues. We would we'd examine. We we have to look at that. But I don't understand what you're asking. Now, Pastor, you said that the revenue will increase over years. So, when the fifth quarter comes on board, how much do you expect annual revenue in terms of the 
the fifth project, I can't, it depends, the revenue is a function of total production times the, our share of cost oil, or so you take out from total production, our share of cost oil, multiply by the market rate, that gives you one stream of revenue, and the second one is the 2% pitch point royalty that we have off the top, which comes off of total production. So when you add the two, it will give you the total revenue of the government. So when the numbers change, that is production levels, that change. I, I can't, you can calculate that for yourself. So if the numbers go up to a million barrels a day, then you can look at that. Uh, you can do the calculation for yourself. Okay, um, That's the formula. Which report? The CGI airport. You know the government has some plans for an acquisition. Airport. CGI. CGI. Yes, yes. But what report? Airport. When it will be completed. Oh, oh, the airport. When it will be completed. Yeah. Oh, okay. Uh, Jill should know this. But I think the part. Remember, we didn't accept. We didn't accept the project when we got back into office. We said the design was changed by APNU. It's supposed to be a new airport. They changed it into a rehabilitation. So in the discussions with the contractors, they said they already bust. And then we said, no, you got to fix. You got to put in a proper facade and a new, and a new, a number of gates plus a new walkway going, I think it's towards the river in that direction. I think that's about to be completed. So we were, when we, we had discussions in Houston with the, the mayor and a team from the Air Civil Aviation, we were trying to get, I think it's United, to fly directly to Ghana. But we might get some help with them to do a master plan from the airport. So that should be moving forward. But part of the master plan is to look at a new terminal building because already we're tight. So a new terminal building that would be somewhere where the hotel is, just in front of the hotel there, that whole area, a two new terminal building, but connected back to the, the infrastructure, the gates. And then the car park would be shifted up elsewhere. So we can have greater capacity now but in a, new, in a new terminal building. So that's what they're examining now. But this one should be the, the facade project, improvement project, because it was in a sad shape. That should have been completed by now. I don't know, Edgehill would be able to give you the exact completion date. I'm more interested in the expansion and how it fits into future traffic flow, because we need eight gates um, there, up to six now, it was four, up to six so we need eight gates and then new processing areas and that will be maybe a two-story building just there um, in that piece too but but integrated back to the main airport so you can have good good flow proper duty-free areas and everything else yeah yeah Yeah, yeah, yeah. So what's the government plans in terms of uh, making uh, or probably increasing salary sufficient so you can keep up or probably just stop? Yeah. Working? So the thing is that um, we have, if you look at what we've done, the taxes we remove from the oil and stuff, if we allowed the full pass through of the increase in the oil prices when it was peak, by now electricity rates would have gone up and what? The government has absorbed those. And almost everyone uses electricity and water. So whether you're big or small, you get a subsidy now from the government for electricity and water because they can carry their costs, especially even the operating costs. Forget the capital costs. All capital costs are carried by the government already and they're fully um, underwritten by the government and supported. So they normally 
are supposed to only cover from their revenue the operating costs, but they can't even, in some cases, cover the operating expenses. So we even have to help to carry that. So everyone gets a benefit. If you go to other countries, go to Serena, that's not the case in many parts of the world. That's one. Two, we have removed all of the taxes back. You, you know the 200 old taxes and the fees. We, we removed those. On fuel, even for the transport, we took it down to zero. The 50% um, um, excise tax that was there on fuel went down to zero. So we are trying to do it in a broad based way that has impact on all other people. So they, get, they do get some help, cash grants and some money, but if you do it in a systemic way, everybody benefits. People don't see that. The person who comes to you will never say that they're being, getting subsidized electricity or water. They will never say that, but you're getting it. You're getting it too. So that is how, and there's a limit to which a country can do that. There's a limit to which a country can do that. So we have made a serious effort. We still have $5 billion, I think, in the budget this year to address additional measures on cost of living. So we will be assisting communities. We haven't even started doing that. Yeah, well, I think that has been dealt with already. I think that has been dealt with air, ventilated, everything. We you know, so that matter has been dealt with publicly. He operates in the U.S. He operates in the U.S. He travels from the U.S. here fr freely, from the U.S. to Guyana. He has the support of the U.S. government behind him. So not not Glenn Lalo. Yeah. <laughs> Glenn has been calling me some bad names, by the way. When I, when I catch him, I was hoping he'd come here so I could address some of his past. He may be wanted in the U.S. himself, and that's why I thought you wanted you know, to fi find the strengthening of the, um, the extradition law. You want to extradite him out of the Kaicho News? Extradition. He, he, he did some bad things in the past, and he, he, since he's cussing me, and, I'm going to talk about, but I'll wait till he comes here, not to deal with the reporters. He's going to go on his TikTok tonight and say, Jack Deal, crazy, Jack Deal, crazy. All right? So that's his standard thing. Anyhow, that's the end of it. I thought we ended there. All right. One more. <laughs> yes. Which project? To review any project. And so oh, from the oil side? Yeah. So when Boy, Glenn Mal might be right to know you might be working for these oil companies now. You, no, you no. suddenly we take enough time to go I through a thorough know. process. To go through a thorough process, Kim. <laughs> we go take enough time to go through a thorough process. Don't worry with the air criticism. They want it overnight, the oil companies. My So, so the policy directive from the office of the president is to get the project done and the approvals given in an expeditious manner without compromising any standards or the negotiations. Safety standards, environmental standards, technical standards. That is the instruction to the ministry. So we have been open that we want things to happen fast, but they have to ensure that they maintain those standards. So sometimes that is the delay. And don't listen to the oil companies alone. Sometimes they don't submit all the documents on time to allow for the review. 
they submit in dribbles, all sorts of things happen in the course of the, the review. So sometimes the review take, uh, the reviews take longer than anticipated. So. What I was, what I was talking about is locals criticizing saying the government is a perfect too quick break. So, so. Oh, yeah. oh really? But, but we made it clear. We want these projects to go forward. And, and so we have not been, the thing is, I come back to this point about getting a clear answer from us, which you can get. You wouldn't get that from the opposition. We're not hiding behind some like, like vague words. We want to do this fast because there is a window available to Guyana and the rest of the world, and our people are impatient for development. Our people are impatient, they need, and we need to meet their aspirations. And so we are doing this. But on the other hand, we're not doing this with, uh, with, by compromising any standard. And that is the key thing for me. So if it takes two, three months with more, and the oil companies complain, because they always complain it's not done in time, then fine, it has to be done. You recall when the Payara was done, we just got into office and they said something like the 16th of August they had to get it. We just got in like on the, I don't know, 5th of August and, and we had to get it done. And we said, no, 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 we take our time. We're not gonna, and if you don't do it, then the investors might not want to come. We're not influenced by that. We have to get it done properly, but we want to do it expeditiously. Yes, please. No. The thing is that the fin financing, so a project could be financed from equity or loans. It could be financed from equity and or loans. So if you, if you make a loan to the company, the local company, then you have to get a, a return in the form of a interest payment at a particular rate. If you make an equity injection, you get a return on your equity. So that is it. W regardless of whether you make the financing in a form of a loan or equity, you have to get a re return. There's a cost of capital. And that, that, that is how it is. Our, generally, we had this issue when we were developing the hydro with Blackstone. We, they wanted to do a 20% rate of return on equity, but we could have borrowed at maybe 8, 9%. So it was in our interest that we co-invest in the equity. That's how we were using the funds we have at the IDB. 100 million, it is something million now, 85 million, to invest in equity so that we can have more loans and they have less equity because equity was remunerated at a higher rate. So that's what you need to explore when you analyze their data. And, and, and this is the question you should put to, put to them. I don't want to be answering every time for Exxon too. You have to answer that. Get them a clear answer from them. Then you can get a response from me. Get, seek a clear answer from them. Is there a standard rate in the PRP? No, no, no. We, we, no, because we are not paying anything. The government of Ghana is not paying anything. So they are, they, because they have to raise the, the financing using the best efforts, the most, the cheapest cost of financing. That is what they're supposed to do as a company, right? So this is what can be analyzed even in when you look at the revenue back, the, 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 not the, uh, the cost back, the cost back. So let's go, let's move on. Um, yes, anything else? Thank you, thank you very much.